and sort of aggregated statistics. So I think this is a really fantastic initiative. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's very compelling what you've said that, um, and the evidence that's been provided by both you and UNICEF about children being more likely to be poor than adults. Um, and the importance of measurement in particular, I think, for galvanizing uh, political will and for kind of highlighting the importance of policy intervention and, 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 and also practic practical interventions as well. Um, and I think it fits very well with the SD. I mean, this, this was a model that you were developing before the SDGs, but it fits incredibly well with the SDGs. And it's, it's very fortuitous that the SDGs provide a multidimensional framework, which maps very well onto the multidimensional poverty index that you've, you've worked with. Um, I think the focus on inequality and social justice issues, the issue of leaving nobody behind, is also critical when we think about uh, the implications for children. And of course, the encouragement to disaggregate data in all cases by age and by other status determinants is absolutely vital for a, for a project of this nature. But I would also like to highlight, I think that this is a moment in history when um, children have come up the political agenda. There's a kind of almost a hidden, unwritten um, agenda behind it all, and I'm not always terribly um, pleased about this, but let's face it, this is you know, often spoken of as the largest generation of young people that has ever existed, the, the current generation of young. Um, and the concern here isn't necessarily about well-being, development and poverty and justice issues for young people, but it's often very much about, you know, how can we stop the poor from young from migrating to the West? How can we prevent young people who are unemployed and in poverty from being enticed into extremist um, politics and recruitment into terrorism? So somehow one's got to be using the momentum that that discourse um, is building to our advantage. Um, it's a difficult hook to be hanging the sort of social justice and poverty argument on, but it's actually a moment when we can, I think, take advantage of that. And I think there's also, at the same time, because of the focus on growth um, at the national level, uh, there's, there's a very strong um, emphasis on human capital formation and very powerful evidence that human capital formation begins in utero. It's, it's absolutely vital in the first thousand days of life and there is the real risk that if you haven't invested in those very early years, then there's going to be a tremendous loss of momentum down the line and across the life course. Um, I think you painted a very, what could be potentially a very um, gloomy picture, and indeed it is, but I think it's also important to remind ourselves that um, there have been some important trends, and it's really important to sort of hook ourselves into those trends as well. Economic growth has brought infrastructural and service expansion and development in, in significant degree. Um, we have seen in some areas falling absolute poverty and reductions in child mortality in some um, contexts. And I think that's also an important trend that we need to be mapping on. But I think the social and economic inequalities are really clear and indeed they're very, very entrenched. And I think that's what's at the heart of of both UNICEF and, and your multidimensional work. It's that entrenched um, sectors of, the, of society that we, we're, we're thinking about. And I think the other thing that's really troubling is, yes, we've had dramatic service expansion, but the quality of services in many cases is absolutely abysmal um, and possibly even deteriorating. And incre increasingly, actually, what we're, we're seeing in our study is the encroachment of the private sector into service provision um, with two implications. On the first um, hand, it, in many cases, this is unregulated, the private sector. And on the other hand, the poor are buying into private sector services at great cost, actually. Um, the poorer you are, the more difficult it is to be able to afford these kind of services. So I think we see some really um, positive, but also some quite troubling trends. So that's really by way of background. I just wanted to say a few things about um, Young Lives, the Young Lives evidence. Um, we're a dual cohort 
longitudinal study that has been following 12,000 children in Ethiopia, India, Vietnam and Peru since 2002. We use mixed methods, so we have um, surveys. We now have five waves of, of um, survey data and we also have qualitative research with a subsample of the children. Um, the dual cohort structure is quite important, as I will show you in some of the um, evidence we've got, because we are interviewing the younger children. There's seven years between the two cohorts. We're interviewing the younger ones um, at the same ages that we were interviewing the older ones, which enables us to see some of the trends, changes in the environments in which they, in which they live. And I want to raise that as some of the challenges that I think we face in measurement going forward. Um, the, 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 the sample is very diverse. Um, it's a pro-poor sample, and the study is a study of child poverty, but it's very diverse socially in terms of ethnicity, caste, language, and religion, and also location. There's a, a dispersal across rural and urban sites. I'm not going to focus very much on the, um, the diversity of the sample, um, so much as really emphasize some of the things that have already been said, but also to add um, certain specific technical aspects that we, that we really focus on in the study. We're very much about the determinants of, of child poverty, the mechanisms of poverty transmission and the outcomes. And we have a life course perspective, which means that we're not just thinking about disaggregating between children and adults, which is extremely important, as, as, as you emphasised, but we're also interested in what's happening across childhood in the different phases of childhood. And I think also in, in doing a longitudinal study, we've, had, we've got some opportunities that you don't have in cross-sectional research, but we also have come up with some interesting challenges of, for measurement. So, just to reinforce some of the messages that we've already heard, my, my, first, my first point is why child poverty matters. Um, so the argument is that despite economic growth in all four of the Young Lives countries, which has been quite notable across the, the two decades almost that we've been in the field, um, in 2006, a quarter to a third of the five-year-olds were physically stunted due to undernutrition in early childhood. That's a pretty high, we're not nationally represented, but that's a pretty high prevalence rate across all four of the, the countries in the study. Not surprisingly, children from the poorest households and those whose parents had the lowest levels of education were the most likely to suffer from both chronic and acute undernutrition. But the important point which I think really reinforces this notion of multidimensionality is that children's development comprises multiple domains and these domains interact. So what happens nutritionally and in terms of children's physical growth has impacts not only on their cognition, their learning, their performance at school, but also their psychosocial well-being as we find in our study. So in, for example, Children who were stunted at age five were 19% less likely to be able to read a simple sentence like, I like dogs, or the sun is hot, three years later than were their not unstunted peers. And I think it's really important to emphasize that deprivation in early childhood has lasting adverse consequences for children especially because of the interaction of these multiple domains of, of development. And I think that's a really big point that can be emphasised in the child MPI index. But at the same time, it's important for us to acknowledge that human development, including child development, even for vulnerable children, is extremely dynamic, even in contexts of poverty. So one of the things that we've discovered, which actually was considered very controversial when we first began to, to narrate these findings, is that growth recovery from stunting, and indeed faltering also, occurs throughout childhood and into adolescence. In the past, it's been stated as an orthodoxy that children stunted in the first thousand days of life are not able to recover, but we do actually find by going back into the field and, and checking the children's growth over a regular period of time that actually there is potential for recovery, and, but also for refaulting later on. 
And that recovery is quite dramatic. Um, we find that between five and eight years um, of age, it ranges from 30% in India to 47% in Ethiopia. This has enormous implications, obviously, for policy, because if you, if you have the argument that children cannot recover from stunting effectively, if you've not prevented it in early childhood, then there's nothing you can do. Those, those children who are stunted will, will remain lost, uh, uh, if you like, for, for good. But our argument is that there is potential for remedial intervention, and indeed we should be looking at that and looking at the measures that work in that respect. It's important that growth recovery can also be associated with improvements in cognitive skills. So it has implications for children's uh, performance at school as well as their, as, as, as their growth. So I think my point here centrally is that this shows the value of a life course perspective and it shows that it's, win it's worth continuing to measure and also to consider later interventions in childhood and not just to focus on early childhood, which is actually where a lot of the, the policy is. Perhaps rightly that's where the priority is, but it's, we must not forget the, the recovery story. Um, I think there are some really interesting and important challenges to measurement that are being posed currently by the, the very dynamic environments in which young people are growing up today, and including young people, people in extreme poverty, young people who are multidimensionally poor. So by comparing the two age cohorts in the Young Lives sample, at the same ages, as I said, but at different points in time, we find that the risks that are faced by children are actually changing quite significantly. So while undernutrition in general is, is overall on the decline, um, in Peru especially, obesity prevalence has been increasing really significantly. And this is especially amongst children in the poorest households. So we need to be thinking ahead of our, with our MPI um, indicators. I don't think anybody would have thought that a measure of obesity might be a better way of gauging poverty in urban middle income countries, for example, in children in the future. But certainly in the health community, this is recognized as, as the, if you like, the biggest evolving health disaster that faces low and middle income countries in the future. I think the other point um, which I've already made is about systems expansion and service delivery. Education expansion, the access to education now in, amongst our children in, in the Young Lives sample is pretty much universal. And that's a, a really significant advance that we must all acknowledge. Not surprisingly, Ethiopia, being the poorest country, was the country where we've seen the highest rise in, in access over time. If, but in, the other countries were pretty much near universal, even from the outset. And I think in Ethiopia in particular, it's, it's a rise in access in rural populations, which I think needs to be celebrated as a success story because rural populations are so often the ones that are most likely to be left behind. But increased access, as I've mentioned, does not guarantee quality or indeed relevance, and this is a really big deal for young people, is the kind of education that they're getting actually going to serve their entry into decent work or into entrepreneurship. Um, it's important to acknowledge that in the Young Lives sample, the younger cohort generally performed better than their older co cohort did at the same age. But learning levels may even be falling in some specific respects in India and Ethiopia, where we find that fewer children in the younger cohort were able to answer the same mass questions as the older cohort were. So there's the risk that massification may actually be undermining quality. I think there's also another very important point to make about service delivery, and that is that education systems can exacerbate home disadvantage. So while we considered education to be a right, we need to be very careful about the way in which it engages with children from poor families. Um, we find that poorer children arrive at school already less ready than their, uh, than their, their peers for school. 
The gaps in receptive vocabulary are apparent at age five, and this predicts achievement in maths and reading seven years later. So they are already disadvantaged, but it actually drives on through their childhood. But more troublingly, perhaps even, is that in Peru, the better off children are taught by teachers with greater pedagogical and content knowledge who are better able to prepare lessons and to help students understand their mistakes. So even when poor and less poor children are in the same school, they get lower quality education. So we're seeing the ways in which schooling can amplify disadvantages that come from the home. So this very dynamic relationship between child, household, and the community and the services that they access is really important as a story to tell when we're narrating the, the implications of poverty for children. So it brings to me the, uh, a serious question about some of the measures we currently do use. In education, for example, so much of the focus is still on enrollment and the years of schooling, which seems to me to be increasingly moribund. Um, as measures. So I'm hoping that the political activity that the child MPI and that UNICEF's work on extreme poverty is generating is also going to question the orthodoxy around some of the in indicators that are being used, as well as propose new indicators that might be much more meaningful for children in the 21st century. Most of the indicators that we've been using relate to a prior century when things were really very different. So finally, just one point I would like to make about the, what I consider to be a global learning crisis um, is that we need robust measurement of school performance at national and indeed subnational level. Um, young lives didn't start out to be studying school systems but when we realize the extent to which the families and children in our sample were invested in education, the extent to which family aspirations and expectations for their children were focused on education, the sacrifices that families were making in order for their children to attend school, sacrifices which included selling land, selling their homes, going into debt, long-term debt, these, these, it made us realize just how central education was to the whole notion of childhood and child poverty. So we started to look at the performance of the schools that the children were attending in the Young Life Sample, and also children that are not in the Young Life Sample but are in, in their peers. And I just think it's important to, to highlight um, that there are Re really important differences in the performance of different systems in the different countries. Being a comparative study, we're able to highlight that. At age five, in the younger cohort, mathematics achievement levels were similar across the four countries. But by age 15, which is um, for the older cohort, this had widened dramatically. But basically, in Vietnam, children are learning so much more than they are in the other three countries. It's also a pro-poor system, so that the poor children are actually catching up with their better off peers. So I think it's going to be really important to interrogate the systems as much as the child and the household data in order to get a better sense of some of those important indicators that you're coming up with in, in the UNICEF and the MPI um, research. Thank you.